Are you unable to concentrate on the tasks at hand? Do you need help focusing more or leveling up your game? Here's a tip. Try Cognizant Citicoline, clinically studied to support mental energy, focus, memory, and attention. Cognizant supports brain health and supplies the brain with the energy it needs to stay sharp. Cognizant is a leading nootropic featured in over 200 products. This podcast is powered by Cognizant. Visit Cognizant.com to learn more and find a product to help you fuel your day. Ready to achieve great heights? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to Power Your Performance, the podcast where we dive deep with leaders in the gaming world and beyond and learn the techniques they use to power their lives. I am your host, Gary Kleinman. Megan Van Patten, welcome to Power Your Performance, powered by Cognizant. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I am fantastic, especially since I'm talking to the person that created the Esports Trade Association. That, that, that's always um, a good person to know. So tell me, you started gaming when? I think as soon as I could hold it in my hand, because I consider gaming playing. I mean, we're really always gaming. We all game and we all play, if you really think about it. Oh, there's no question. I mean, if you look at gaming, um, even when you go to the market, right, and you give them a telephone number so you get that right. 10 cents off bananas, uh, that's a game. I mean, it's all incentive-based yeah. behavior. So if people... Um, I think it's changing. Uh, the perception of what gaming is today is different than than it was, you know, four, five, and certainly ten years ago. That that people thought gaming was just shooting people um, with a console, and and it's anything but that. But from from a form, not formal, but your first recollection of like a video game is when. Yeah. So, um, you know, I always tell this story that. I actually bought my family our our very first Atari system. Um, I have all brothers and you know then it was very hard for me to get time um, with them. They they ran faster than me. <laughs> they were they were athletes. They were um, you know, if I wanted to play, basically I played uh, Dungeons and Dragons, okay. Atari. I grew up on chess. That was, I don't even remember learning it. I played so young. Okay. So um, are you the, are you the baby in the family with the brothers? I'm number three. Okay. And, um, and was it a competitive environment? You know, that's a, that's a really good question. It actually wasn't. Back in those ages, it was very boys and girls, and it was very different. And think, you know, for the most part, it was like um, truly, it was like wrong for my brother to play with my doll, or it was like wrong for me to play with his matchbox cars. And we were what used to be called Irish twins, um, and now it's just so different. And and we we really enjoy that there's been a lot of gender centric um, education. So things have changed. But I, um, you know, the one ad, you know advantage I could have was game, was chess, you know, Monopoly, cards, pinnacle, things of that sort. But video games, I just never had the competitive edge, nor did I um, in most anything physical, you know, from swimming to running. Um, they were just, you know, more genetically gifted than I am. But um, I really, you know, I, I grew up playing and um, I still play. Um, I still love play. I love fun. I love following the fun. And um, probably the greatest thing that I learned to play that I'm glad I play is chess. Because I think during that development, um, th that really instrumental time, it really helped me in life. I think my brain developed sharper and more strategically because um, I am a, a thinker uh, as far, you know, the, and, a, and a finisher as well as a starter. But competition was never really, a, um, it was never, maybe, maybe it was literally beat out of me because I lost so much. <laughs> <laughs> the benefit of having a sister sometimes. Uh, no, chess without a doubt. I mean, if you're going to look at life skills, um, 
chess from uh, gameplay and strategy and what I think, you know, from playing chess as in, as in my life early on was you weren't thinking necessarily about your next move, but three, four moves past that. Right. So you're, you, I mean, it's about as strategic as you can as you can get and you can play anywhere you know what, what i love about chess is you can go to washington square park in new york i know you're in chicago but um and they're open chess games you know you go to venice beach and yeah. there are all the chess masters that are playing there um and yeah. it's it is a universal game without language and and the, and same rules wherever it is that you're playing and then every once in a while somebody comes up with a great netflix film about chess and it's fascinating when you get yes. into that level of of chess as gameplay um so it's a great yeah, it is it is fantastic so um looking at you know your your history um i think what what i found the first kind of gaming professional association was the the fantasy sports association oh yes 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 yeah. another so, one <laughs> no there you go so so tell me about that because i i love the history and, and your story sure. because so much of that are the building blocks and bricks for what you're doing today so it, it gives True. us great context to understand that and what you're going through and thinking at the time and how you're spending your time so tell me about that yeah that's a really good question so when i was looking at representing that association i talked to um my little brother and i was like what you know what do you think of this industry what do you think is going to happen and he's like oh man you, you you just have to take this job because this is what who this is who I want to meet and you know, he rattled off you know he was just a major ESPN um, listener and a big fan of Matt Berry and he's like I'll do whatever it takes you know you got to take this gig again the best days of my brother's lives and still to this day is draft day. You know, and I was part of the day when they would do it with poster board and, you know, the big uh, the big sheets and I helped them. So it's true. Like, really, if I wanted to hang out with my brothers, I had to do things that wouldn't necessarily be my choice. You know, it's funny um, you say that because um, I'm old enough to remember what they used to call rotisserie baseball yeah. before it was fantasy which will age right. me completely because half the uh -huh. people will not have a clue yeah, that it was called rotisserie we right? heard about the rotisserie magazine oh yeah the, <laughs> and 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 at the beginning the, you know there was yeah. certainly no internet and your right. stats would come on yes. monday yeah and my kids would race home mm -hmm. and tear open the mail because the boys would fight over who got to see the stats first and yeah. and draft day um, yeah. around the conference table in, in my then office till four in the morning with right. people with stacks of books and magazines. Yes. And they had statistics going back to high school. Um, oh, yeah. And we still laugh about it. So I, I understand, you know, your brother saying, boy, that draft day, you just couldn't wait. Um, and it was really only then baseball. Yeah. You know, now it's yes. uh, now it's everything. You know, you have probably fantasy shopping networks. I don't know. It's um, but it's fascinating. So, so your interest came from just being involved in their well, yeah. life, so to yeah, speak. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple things, Gary. So, for starters. Let me just share with you, yep. two of my three brothers are chess masters. Okay. So like, I just had no chance of being <laughs> the MVP in my family for real. Um, my dream was always to go to like Miss Pac-Man and once ever see my initials and not one of my brothers. <laughs> so I, I mean, I really lost. I have one brother that is, that is a musicologist that plays every instrument by ear. Like I was like not the coolest and I had to just play with them to play. So, you know, this was a industry that needed representation to let people know who played fantasy mm. at that time, you know? I have, um, you know, my, my little brother, he's, he was very bright. He was a champion statistician at the firehouse. That's what he read about, you know? So people don't understand the community. Well, they didn't then. Right. So I thought, let me look at this at a different angle. I really enjoy my brothers being happy and I really enjoyed the play. 
of the community and the, and the community around fantasy. So what I did was I jumped into a couple of fantasy leagues and let my brother manage them with me. And it was a, just a lot of fun. At that t- time, you would win the pot at the end of the season and it would be like $80 and you'd take right. your, your team to lunch. So then, you know, people that were saying, oh, it was gambling or, you know, da, 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 da. I was like, it's really not. It's community. I was raised in a village that was, you know, community uh, townhome living. It was community who raised me and I'm a, just an advocate of community. So I know that that game brought out the best of my family. It sounds like, you know, great days for you too. So that was the initial, you know, seal of the deal to um, to have a voice in that space. Well, yeah, when you, you talk about community, it's interesting because when I first got into esports and gaming, um, I did a deep dive into it because I had tripped across an article about a uh, 17-year-old Canadian female gamer playing in a League of Legends tournament at Madison Square Garden, and the article said, I think 15,000 people were there, and I thought, that had to be a typographical error. I could not imagine 15,000. So I did a whole deep dive from a marketing perspective because that's my background. And my takeaway was gaming is not about the game per se, it's about the community around the game okay. and that the games are transient, right? So, yeah. and I, you know, I use this example you know, fairly uh, consistently. If you look at Fortnite four or five years ago, I mean, that was everything was Fortnite. You know, divorces yeah. were happening over Fortnite. Kids were not going to school because of Fortnite. I was getting calls from friends saying, <laughs> you gotta help me. You know, my wife is screaming at me because my kid won't stop playing Fortnite. Okay, not my problem. What? Uh, and then Fortnite obviously is not what it was, not that it's not popular, but it's not what, but the community has stayed intact. And, and there's so many stories that I have, as I'm sure you do, about the community of gaming and not the game that are unbelievably powerful. Right. And, 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 that, and that's cool. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's just cool because that's not yeah. happening in stick and ball sports. Right. You know, for the most part. Well, I mean, behind the game or beyond the game is really, you know, what fascinates me. Yep. And um, that's what I specialize in is the community part of it, you know, behind the game and beyond. So so you were kind of the first real team owner, right? You, you had a team and then you hired your brother to manage it. <laughs> well, you know what we did? We I, I actually in the day this was this might have been at least 10 years ago. I joined a couple of different platforms okay. to see which one I liked. Um, and, and yeah, my brother managed them for me and I had a, a different name because I was, I was, you know, the, the director of the association. So I couldn't win really. I had to be very careful, you know, so I was just kind of doing it for the experience and to learn. And I never do divulge the, which companies that we played, you know, um, but it was a lot of fun. I think once I did a, a lady celebrity, um, a lady celebrity, uh, and I, I don't remember how well I did on that one, but Stefania Bell and a couple other, you know, great ladies. Uh, and that was more of a public fun. People watched what we chose. And, and, and you know, my brother, you know, one of the one of the greatest days, because he really was the one that encouraged me to take, you know, take on this project. When we were taking our walk into Wrigley Field and our favorite outdoor little like when you're walking into Wrigley Field, there's this outdoor huge space, like a bar kind of patio. And there it was, it said DraftKings. And we were just like, oh, my gosh, because we, you know, we had met, we had known, you know, when when it was an idea and it was just it was just cool at, you know, our nostalgic field. So it was a great run. It wasn't very difficult when um, the. You know, a similar group of the community came to me with the esports um, opportunity that needed a trade association. It wasn't a very difficult decision, you know, to to get a, a group of strong people together and you know call a meeting and, and see how we can how we can uh, support this industry. And and when that happened, uh, which is thank you, that's a great segue. I appreciate that. Uh, sure. What was your involvement, knowledge, or or comfort level with esports as a vertical? It's never intimidated me because I was never great at almost anything I ever sport I ever played. <laughs> so I, I really didn't. It didn't matter. Um, no sport would really intimidate me. Um, you know, 
I, I, I like football, but it doesn't mean that I ever, ever caught up one right. <laughs> or, th- or through one. Well, I should say, you know, so th- there was literally zero um, intimidation for the industry. I, again, just came into the space and looked for a couple of leaders and had a round table uh, meeting with who, who wanted to make the trip to Chicago. And that was, you know, about five years ago, um, where, and, and, uh, It'll be five years, actually, in, in next month. We'll be five yeah. years old. So it just started with one meeting, maybe maybe 20 people, you know, ten probably 10 stepped up. We still have a couple founding members. Um, a lot of the founding people are still with us, but I think one is still serving on the board. Well, it's and it's changed so much in, in even five years from um, from the business side. And good, bad, and, and we can we'll talk about some of that shortly. Uh, sure. Scale, you know, in terms of being able to be in international reach in terms of esports, um, and and also I think what's changed because I've been in and around esports for about I don't, almost six years, five and a half years. Is it's no longer a cry for help. It it has legitimacy, and yeah. it has um, acceptability. And it's just getting to a place where I think parents are saying it's okay for kids to play. There's the opportunity for scholastic uh, academic scholarships. There's certainly no shortage of jobs for gamers. And then you look at you know the FAA, FAA hiring gamers, there's air traffic controllers in the military, which owns and what have you. What other things have you seen in the last five years through the lens of the association that has changed dramatically? That's a good question. Um, You know where I've always had a heart is um, for the athletes. So I'm really, you know, like just bringing the show back to its its mission and purpose. Um, I really care about the athlete you know, pre-play, post-play, the health and wellness, the integrity around, you know, um, caring for uh, what we've learned, you know, what's happened to football players and what's happened to wrestlers and what's happened to kids being pulled out of high school to be put into pro. Um, or, you know, with these sports, it's even more sensitive because, they, you know, the children are younger. So I've really been grateful for the awareness that's raised around the health and wellness of the player. Um, That I have seen more in this industry of this game than anywhere. And I, and, and it means the most because the kids are, the athletes are younger. Well, I I obviously agree because that's what skins.gg is all about is, is healthy, product services and support uh, yeah. for, the, for the entire um, gaming world and and to do it from a perspective of longevity um, mm-hmm. and and it's critically important because what's and, and the and then what triggered uh, skins getting involved was conversations we were have I was having with medical practitioners that were almost complaining um, that their practices were exploding with very early carpal tunnel syndrome and yeah. very early anxiety issues and very early uh, almost PTSD related yeah. things and and um, over caffeinated and and yeah. and less um, sleep you know or sleep dev- uh, deprived people of all ages but certainly um, getting younger and then the fights in the house between the parents and kids and mm-hmm. and what have you and I thought you know that. As you said earlier, everybody's gaming, so we really need to to start educating um, more so than anything else. You, people that buy products or services, that's great if they do, but it's more about the education of how do you lay the foundation um, going forward. So that first meeting, you get a handful of uh, thought leaders in the space. What was it then, um, uh, the consensus of that group for the mission of the association well it was really interesting um one of the bigger challenges of esports um and as as an industry has been the simplicity of 
what is a trade association? So that was probably, Gary, that was probably my biggest struggle um, at that meeting, at that first one, because Interesting. I had to tell these guys and gals, and it was about 50-50, look, I only know trade association and they in community and there were there were more needs like we need alliances and we need you know the the game you know what about the gamers and the athletes and there were so many things at that time and i was like i agree and they'll come but this is this is all i could do and and then the, then there was a vote actually to um to make the name something different than the Esports Trade Association, and it won. Okay. And um, and that's when I went back and I was like, I I don't like I don't know. This isn't what I do though. If you <laughs> like, so I, like, yeah. And um, so then I had to like just say, can we just be the trade association? <laughs> and they were right in many senses that it was like what do we need trade associations for? It's 20, you know, 2016 or 2017 or 2018 or whatever year it was. And, um, you know, but that, that's just what I do. <laughs> so I don't know if we want to do what I do. Um, and was, you know, it, so, was there a focus at that meeting of who you thought the target membership should be? Was it For me, there was, you know, and that, that's why I called the meeting. And I just wanted to create this association for the, the trade of esports, period. Just like, you know, the American Medical Association has an association. And, and if you're a dermatologist, you're part of the American Dermatology Association under the tent of the AMA. You know, so it's like very simple to me, but it wasn't to the entire group. So I had a really challenging time from day one. Um, what is a trade association? Why do we need it? And and that, you know, even to this day. Um, and so was that it, conversation, uh, are we about the individual athlete that needs a place of, of comfort and support and education and opportunity? Um, and are there people saying, well, you know what, the brands need a place as well. And then the organizations need a place as well. And the, yes. uh, the educators mm -hmm. need a place as 100%. well. hundred percent. But there you have to start be... someplace, right? So exactly. how do so you that, decide? Exactly. So that's what I proposed. I said, can we just be the big time? Can we be the family reunion of esports? Can we just do it once a year? Can we make it easy in Chicago, make it Midwest? Let everyone else do all those other specialty clubs, alliances, you know, federations. Guys like the you know, gals, this is this is all I this is all I know. I can stretch, but you know, if you want me to do what I just did, this is the way, you know. So it, you know, it took a minute and 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 then it took a minute for the whole industry to understand that. We're not competitive either. We're like, please join us. Yes, start the Players Association for Esports and start the Collegiate Association for Esports. And, you know, please, you know, because the that more the merrier. All needed. Exactly. And that whole message took far longer. And I should have got the memo from the first meeting. I, I really had no clue it would be such a climb. And uh, it's been an interesting one. And I've, I've learned a lot. Well, you know, it's interesting, um, especially with, you know, esports, um, and it's phenomenal, as I said, especially from a, a communal standpoint. Baseball, basketball, hockey, even even medicine is kind of the, the same wherever you go. Esports is not. I mean, it's it's divided by genre, it's divided by games, and there's very little crossover. So if you're a Valorant fan, you're not necessarily playing CSGO. And if you're going to sponsor... Um, as, as a consumer package good or a consumer brand, you really have to drive down to your audience within the eSports space, and it may be a tiny fraction of the entire eSports vertical. And, and I think eSports has a challenge from that perspective, and I think the trade association, probably better than anybody else, has the ability to give it a unified message. Sure. And um, that's really where our committees 
of experts come in. You know, we pretty much have a committee for everything and uh, we try to anyways. We try to we try to just utilize our old Robert Law best practice, uh, you know, as as old as time. So uh, that 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 keeps us in pretty healthy shape. So has that friction kind of been diluted? It's it's easier to get things done now than it was five years ago or to get consensus than it was five years ago? That's a that's a good question. You know, like when you're working in community with a lot of people that have a lot of stake, consensus, you know, no, is, without a doubt, with it, without is, it. is is really always it's it's um. I love our town halls. I love you know our board meetings. I love our roundtables, and um, I'll tell you the people that are that are making the difference or being heard are the people that are here that are volunteering and and there's a seat at the table for everyone and anyone. So I love um, creating the big huge tent with the big huge table and whoever wants to pull their seat up and talk about whatever topic. We have a leader that's talking about it that that is running those meetings monthly, and it's uh, very special. And I'm very I'm very honored to be able to serve in this industry, and I'm very honored to be able to serve in this capacity because it is effective. Yeah, I'm listen. I think I think what what's good about it, and and maybe it's the path of least resistance is all the factions within esports, whether they agree or they don't agree. Um, there's commonality in building esports as um, a long-term venture, both from a gaming perspective, from an engagement perspective, and and figuring out the business perspective to the industry. Yeah. And, and, I, and I would think everybody can come together um, with, with that. Um, I think they do. Um, I think it's a challenge, especially in this environment as... Uh, Yesterday, you know, a whole lot of esports organizations started announcing layoffs and how that's going to impact um, that side of the world. And, uh, you know, associations are great with that. Um, so the, the purpose of the association, do you also um, look to help people find employment or is it more about kind of a wholesale approach to esports? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, we have a lot of um, opportunities for networking, and I'm a huge believer in the good old fashioned way. Um, Certainly, we hear from people when they're in transition um, and, you know, they come to the coffees or the happy hours and, you know, that that's what happens, you know, when you lose your job or, you know, it's eliminated or, you know, I, I encourage everyone, you know, whatever your hobby is, there's an association for and for for anything pretty much. May as well work in a may as well work in an industry that you're playing in. So we, we do see that. We see um very large companies like um Encore, mm-hmm. um, which is a you know very large, I believe, publicly traded. I'm, I'm not sure who sponsors um, career fairs. I think they're quarterly here. Um, the last one, I, I want to say they had just a couple thousand jobs available. And um, I think they're also going to be having a, a small uh, career fair um, space in, at our conference uh, next month. So they go about it a little bit um, more creatively where um, <laughs> I actually have never seen it done so well we have a zoom open career fair day um it's almost like a linkedin live for our members and you see you see the zoom and you see the the different people and i i'm going by memory so excuse me if my facts are a little off but it would be like um the the 10 different hiring managers and you see their their name at the bottom of the screen where it might say hr or um you know business development or research and data and then you you log in and you go into their room and you get to like have your interview right there with that's fantastic the person. And, and in that room 
when you go into the room is who, your actual team. I mean, they put a lot of thought into this. You know, they're Encore, so they're you know they're they're an event company, so they make the whole virtual job fair an incredible experience. Actually, they built their time technology before the pandemic, so by the time we used it it was like wow they were ahead of their time well yeah that's what they do that's so do. That, that, no that's great that, that's great so let's talk about the conference it's coming up sure um it's your annual conference yes uh, it's in chicago yes and what do you what does the association what 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 does at the end of the conference you look at your your board or you look at yourself in the mirror and you go what does success look like from the association perspective then i'll probably ask you the same question um of what success looks like you think from an attendee uh perspective but from the association what does success look like I could tell you what success success looks like for me personally first um I have done events for so long, you know, and um, I genuinely like to make them as authentic as possible. And here's an example. Even I have gone to meetings or um, dances or, you know, my associations having like a, a pool party, you know, on Saturday. And who hasn't been to a meeting where you feel weird when you walk in or you feel nervous? Um, We all have had that feeling. I work very hard to make sure that doesn't happen. And I don't know how I do it, but I, I genuinely believe that I have the gift of hospitality. And I go on record to say that all the time. And I tell everyone, if you're considering coming and you really feel the event is very warm and not awkward, you know, that is first and foremost, because you never forget how someone or something makes you feel. Without a doubt. And that is what I call purposeful networking, purposeful connections, very, very, very genuine. Um, And that's my goal. So when people are leaving they are feeling like they just left a week of sleepover camp (laughs) and who doesn't remember that because you get dropped off at camp and you're like bye mom (laughs) and then your mom shows up to pick you up and you're like you're here what are you doing here i'm not ready to go so that that's like how you know my um that's my intention okay um and 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 i and when i have a party um people come and they come back and that's what it is it's a big reunion of of the esports industry that has you know networking events incredible content speakers um with great you know a great venue uh, a great a, a great backdrop of chicago which you know i think is the best city in the world we love the hyatt centric they're a wonderful partner where um, the the Wit rooftop is um, an incredible space where we have our final night party. Scott Greenberg is a hotelier and he hosts us there. So he specializes in venues and hotels and he's here in Chicago. Um, he's actually behind the Surge project um, that we're building in Bronzeville. And um, so for, you know, set, Second would be that, you know, everybody feels what our purpose and intention is. Okay. And and the same question from an attendee. What would you like an attendee to be leaving and, and telling to somebody else, not necessarily to you, of, yeah. it was a great event because, yeah. and fill in that, that blank. Yeah, yeah. So that is another um We've designed the event very strategically. There are lots of space. So when you come, you can do the event in one day if you only have one day. And you could get the content and get to the party at the wit. Now, if you want to come and stretch it out and have the whole family reunion feel, you have Sunday, the the ball game, okay? And that's at Wrigley Field. So that's at one o'clock. Then you have Sunday night open. So what do you want to do? Do you want to meet with clients? Do you want to meet with family? You know, what do you want to do when you're in town? 
Then Monday morning, you've got that open as well. We have an industry roundtable at noon, I think. Like, don't quote me. We have an agenda. Okay. And we get the, you know, the minds meeting, the town hall, if you will. So you don't have to really show up Monday if you're an attendee until the purposeful networking, which is so good, Gary. We have these really long tables and it's like speed dating. So when you come, you are going to in, I think it's 90 seconds, you have 90 seconds and you, and, and they, and they're moving back way. So in, in, I want to say like an hour, you will have met everyone for 90 seconds if you come, which is probably at least 200 of the 400 people we capacity at 400. So, um, then since you have had the brief meet and greet of the 200 people, then you could kind of hone in on, yo, Joe, hey, right. we need to talk again because da, 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 da. So I love that speed networking, kind of a speed dating component. Then, you know, you're only on night one. Then we have a cocktail hour. And that's super fun. The bar open brought Encore has been a wonderful sponsor for us. But during that time, um, we have a shark tank kind of feel for a a wild card pitch. So we have anybody who wants go up on stage and pitch their business to go in to the proper shark tank slash elevator pitch the next day. What's so cool about that is any people that were on the fence about pitching or on the fence about um, raising money or something is kind of warmed up. They've gotten their questions answered and, and maybe there's usually around 10 people and then it's an audience vote who wins and then they're able to properly pitch for funding. So that's fun. Now, if you haven't already met the whole room, I don't know what to tell you. You've been, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what to tell you. But remember, this is only like starting at five. So you've already had two days here if you want to poke around Chicago. The next morning is day three, which I call the big day. Right. You want to come in for a lean, mean day, come the big day. It's content, it's it's uh, um, hosted, uh, our master of ceremonies, Lewis Johnson, who is just, you know, amazing. Um, and he brings us through our incredible, you know, industry leaders and content. And then, you know, we end up at a party at the WIT, which is, look, Scott Greenberg said he built the WIT as a bar and put a hotel under it. That's how much he loves the bar. And it's a beautiful bar. It, it just really is beautiful on the top of that hotel. And then the next morning's a grab and go lunch. Um, so the attendee should leave with two to 400 new friends. If they do the four days. Right. No, and, 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 and also, well, so you, you, I mean, you really build in familiarity, which is fantastic, especially in a conference, yes. um, and and reunite people that mm-hmm. um, haven't may not have seen each other, especially with the last couple of years of uh, staying home because because of COVID. Um, so the takeaway for attendees is social, obviously. Uh, right. networking whether it's personal professional or otherwise mm-hmm. and right. and do you have um, a top tier content uh, philosophy that you think is more relevant today than last year or two years ago or totally it, and, here's, and, here's what we do we so. have an events committee and we and they they you know, that is their lane, not mine. So the content's always fresh. The uh, John Davidson um, runs that committee with James Huss and Sharon Gill. And um, anyone can apply to create a panel. Anyone can apply to be a speaker. It's a, it's a long, long process. Um, they, you know, they work on, you know, it, it, it's a team and it's not my lane at all. Um, my gift is my gift is hospitality and really looking at the, you know, the four day um, the map as to how, you know, what, who, what, when, where, how and why and the contents, you know, obviously, I think it's incredible. Yeah, well, there's so there's so there's so much content in this space, um, you know, and as, as a host of, of a podcast, 
I can tell you there's there's no shortage of content and there's no shortage of conversation. Um, and some of it is uh, about the dar- dark downside of what goes on in gaming, um, and most of it's not. But the reality is, in 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 a worldview of an activity, you have all of it, and especially when gaming seems to be the foundation for the metaverse and web two, three, four, whatever web uh, we're on right now. Um, the content is, is just brilliant, and the conversations around it are critical. And and I think you know yeah. every, everything you're doing with the association is fantastic uh, for not only the brands like us that that are in it, um, the colleges and the education, but also for the gamers. And um, there's a lot of information in there for for what I say the circle of influence around gamers, and that's uh, family, mom, dad teachers, neighbors, to really understand what's happening in gaming, yeah. both casually and professionally. And uh, having the association is critical to the success of the industry. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll tell you, um, as a consumer of content and, and also hosting a show, you know, um, I read this book, Everyone Communicates, Few Connect. And um, when we talk about the plethora of content that's coming at us, I really just try to slow down. And when I brought the Esports Connected show to this network, um, they guided me um, beyond what I could have ever expected. Um, I went to them with the, you know, with, with, what do we do here? You know, how can we really you know, create an impact and share these great stories of our members. And it's literally one of the best things I've ever done because I've always done what I do. The one thing I've never done is a show. And it's been literally one of the best experiences. I've always had great events. I've always had great members and, you know, a great governing board and all that. But Esports Connected podcast, which um, literally came from a book I was reading the, the weekend before I met Sia um, for the meeting. Uh, and I thought, let's do Esports Connected. Let's like get connected and, and lift people up. You know, the content's gonna come and come and come. Right. So for me, it's all about the connection. It's all about sharing stories of our members. And um, it, it, it has been the most exhilarating experience, Gary, because for 20 years I've managed associations and heard these incredible stories, and now everyone can. And it's it's one of my favorite parts of, of my day, um, without hesitation. Well, I agree with you, obviously. When, when we talked earlier and you said, uh, is there a list of questions? And I said, well, no, we don't ask questions. We have conversations because this way, yeah. We get to learn your story, um, sure. and I'm sure people that are watching that know you will not know your background and history as you got to where you are, and yeah. and, and I think that's that's critically important. We don't do enough of that. So, yeah. um, in in the interest of time, I thank you for the time spent. Uh, this will be ready before the conference. So, oh, thank you. Um, any last parting words you want to say in advance? of the conference well sure um first of all thank you for having me and being such a gracious host it really has been wonderful to have a casual conversation with you thank you you're doing a great job and you sure do have an awesome voice for radio i i think that is why i thought it was radio today because you have a voice for radio i swear thank you so when i saw you when i logged on i thought to myself wait he's a radio guy and it was just i made that story up but look um I, i would like to invite everyone to join us um in our in in sweet home chicago let us uh entertain you at wrigley field and come enjoy some incredible content and make some new friends you can find me on linkedin i'm megan van petten um or you can just simply go to our website esportsta.org uh the esports trade association and our conference is called esports next come find out what's next Thank you so much, Gary. Megan, thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll, we'll be in touch. Thanks for listening. This podcast is part of the MAP Esports Podcast Network and produced by Innovation Media Enterprises. Please be sure to leave us a review and follow us on your favorite podcast player.